Hey guys, it's Michael here, and I just wanted to give you guys a little bit of an update on something that I've been working on recently. So, yesterday, Wednesday, June 10th, I actually launched the NASCAR Design Community Discord server. Now, this is an entire server that's dedicated to the NASCAR Design Community, and it's designed to also help out aspiring designers. So, what you can do in this server is you can actually submit your schemes that you've designed and you can get feedback from other fellow designers. We have about a, over 100 people in the server right now and it just launched yesterday. So I'm ecstatic, so many people are excited about this. Members of the designer roundtable are in there, including Harris, Lou, Ryan, Sean, Kyle will be joining shortly. And you can also post topics that you wanna talk about on the roundtable that us five can kind of dive into and discuss. So if you wanna join the Discord server, feel free to check out the description below where you'll find the link for it. It's completely free. Everybody's welcome and there's no, no skill set that you need. You can be a beginner designer or an expert designer. This is really a way just to get the whole community together and to kind of learn from each other and network off each other. So again, if you wanna join the Discord server, check out in the description below for the link. Enjoy today's episode. Thank you yeah, guys for good. almost killing me over the COT. <laughs> no. It's going to be a great, great intro. I was trying and... to do the math if like you're still in diapers then or not, but uh -oh. <laughs> you're the youngest and you're the youngest. So in this week's episode, we're going to start talking about more of the behind the scenes work and we're going to talk about the design process of creating schemes, plus the actual guidelines that designers like Kyle, Ryan, Sean, and Harris would have to follow when creating design. So let's start by what's on NASCAR's rule book. Uh, Harris, you helped write the guidelines for paint schemes. So tell me about what are some of the guidelines, some of the do's and don'ts when it comes to creating paint schemes. Uh, every year, start of the year, uh, get together with our, our brand department and our, uh, our, you know, race control department, and we make the guidelines for all of our series cars. So we go through and we do a cup series, a truck series, and an uh, Xfinity series guideline. Uh, specify where you put the series logo, um, the area of the car that's supposed to be, what your windshield header looks like, um, where the NASCAR race car or NASCAR race truck decal goes. Um, then anything special that, that we might have throughout the year, like salutes, um, playoffs, uh, any special campaign that, that we typically do special decals for, we do a guideline uh, for that as well. Um, like coming up, we have Dash for Cash. Um, so there's a different windshield header for the Dash for Cash participants than the other drivers. Um, and there's, there's different circumstances, like a points earning driver, or a non points earning driver, they'll have, they might have different windshield headers. Um, some will have the driver's name, the non-points earning won't have their name on the front windshield, but they'll have it on the back window. Um, so th there's things like that. And then you get into um, the, the deeper parts of the rule book where there's rules about how big your number can be, uh, where it's supposed to be, the amount of contrast between your number and your paint scheme so that, you know, spotters can see it so things don't get confused, so race control doesn't get confused with whose car it is. Um, and it just, you know, there's a lot of things we have to abide by. There's different size regulations. Um, I will admit that a couple of years ago when we did the emojis on the side of the car, um, I did do the guidelines for that and I did create that giant uh, lunch tray white box around the emojis, unfortunately. Um, but <laughs> luckily after some, uh, some fan backlash and probably some backlash from these guys down here, we, we changed that after a week or two um, and then uh, it got it back to where everybody still had an equal space on the car, but uh, but it was a little more aesthetically pleasing. Because at the end of the day, it's all about giving our, our partners and our, our prime sponsors the equal representation um, and making sure that they have a nice visible spot on the car. So something I want to mention real quick, uh, we actually saw something on Twitter. Uh, Davin, who's also known as Drive Through Designs on Twitter, he brought up kind of an interesting point. So he put out a tweet about reflective decals. Now, this, now there were some paint schemes where the number trim was reflective, some even the sponsor word mark was reflective. Can you tell me why that was allowed, you know, 15 years ago and why now those practices are kind of gone? I'm not 100% sure, but from, from what I've heard, from what I've gathered, um, our, you know, transponder system, our uh, timing lines and our things like that that are pointed directly at the sides of the car that have to deal with the position of that car to record where it is at a certain point, um, the reflective decals interfere with that. Um, and that's kind of what we, you know, 
that's what I suspect is, is the big problem. And now we have the laser scanning system. So I, I assume that there's even probably a bigger issue there with lasers reflecting off of reflective decals. Um, because a couple of years ago they were, you know, there were people manipulating spots with different colored decals and we had to spray it all matte or spray it all a, a different shade so that it would be recognized. Um, so there's, there's multiple levels of, of why we can and can't do things. Um, you also can't put a gradient in the number. You can't put patterns in the numbers. Um, just you know, the numbers are very sensitive. They're the, the card identifying feature. So um, anything to obstruct it or, or keep it from being clearly visible is, is a big no-no. Is there any reason why Junior was able to run that um, the metallic turn the Leafs? No clue. Um, I mean, I feel like that was right, right there when those, those metallic things got banned or, or outlawed and his might have even been the reason for it um uh, it was a very tight repeating pattern um so uh, you know that might have been the case somebody made was that you know this was disrupting something or this was making something not function properly um i do miss it i enjoyed that number and uh all the merchandise with it on there is pretty sweet and, and that turn leaf is is really cool um i'm a fan of the metallic stuff i wish we would bring it back but i understand why we can't run it um, but thankfully we've got throwback weekend. We've got special paint schemes that can, can, uh, can keep us going and, and keep us moving and keep that alive at least once a year. Yeah. And, and just to touch on uh, what you said, Harris, about the door numbers, that's, uh, from a designer standpoint, I probably all of the paint schemes that have been rejected, uh, that I've done or been aware of have been due to door numbers. Um, most of them were, uh, rejected. Um, by NASCAR staff that, that reviews them there um, for lack of contrast. So, and it all relates back to, you know, control, being able to identify the car. So I get it. Um, they have to they police that in some way. Um, so it is kind of tricky. And from a designer standpoint, um, some of these rules, we're just trying to, we're figuring out as we go. Like we don't know all the rules, all the rules that we do know are learned from mistakes. <laughs> Um, cause it really, nobody tells us anything, you know, we barely know when our cars run half the time. And, um, you know, some of the rules are, we're just like, well, we design it and then they come back and say, well, you can't do that. And then, you know, it's kind of like the military, you have to learn uh, by being yelled at, you know, from your drill sergeant, <laughs> you just don't know. Um, but you log those in the back of your mind and that kind of, that prepares you for, for paint schemes down the road. So like, I can't do that or I can't. I can't put a gradient across this number or it's going to get rejected or I got to make sure that this contrast, uh, the number contrasts with the paint scheme behind it, uh, or it's going to get rejected and it's going to slow down the process. And to kind of add to what Sean's kind of saying there, uh, earlier this year uh, on Ryan Sieg's car, we, we ended up kind of getting away with, with running metallic silver numbers for the first three races. And a little bit of that was with me uh, kind of not fully knowing what the rules were as far as that goes. Um, and, you know, we just kind of did it and uh, we got away with it for a little bit, but uh, from Phoenix and, and on to now uh, we're having to get rid of those. And, and you know, a couple of reasons that they did give us were, were for transponders and, and TV reasons, but, um, but yeah, you do really do like Sean said, you, you really do kind of learn as you go sometimes. And if you get lucky, you can get, uh, a couple of things on the track like that every now and then. So here's, there's kind of a good segue for what we're going to talk about next. So uh, sponsor pitches to concept to reality. So what I like about the group we have here is that we actually have a very, I guess, diverse uh, group of designers that have worked with multiple levels of teams. You know, we have, you know, with Starcom Racing with Ryan, uh, GFR, for example, with Sean, and, you know, Kyle has attacked GMS and HMS. So, just briefly, you know, I want to kind of compare the, the design process between you guys and, you know, going from, you know, a sponsor pitch to a concept to reality. Kyle, I know recently you had told me about a sponsor pitch you were working on with a Cup Series team. Um, to talk about that process, because I know you also said you were up until like three o'clock in the morning working on this, working on a car. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think all of us can kind of uh relate to this as um i got an email at eight o'clock at night and they said hey listen we got a pitch coming tomorrow morning we need this tonight or, or first thing tomorrow so i mean i think it's just kind of the life of a designer sometimes that um when things are hot we got to get it out but um yeah i mean those are sometimes 
sometimes those are, are tough to, to do just considering, um, you know, if you go from just lounging on the couch one night, you got to somehow dive into that creative space, um, in your brain and, and that can be difficult. But, um, I think we all can probably also relate that once you get in that zone, um, you look up and all of a sudden it's two or three in the morning and you're like, how'd this happen? But, um, yeah, I think, I think it's just, it's just part of the sport and, you know, things, things come quick and there's quick turnarounds and tight deadlines. And, um, you know, I think you just got to get it done. And, and uh, I think we're all very, uh, prideful of our work that we want to do anything we can to get it out there. Yeah, and I think, you know, uh, Kyle is right. We, we've all had those situations where it's, uh, you know, last minute. Everything in NASCAR seems to be last minute. Um, just do the ever-changing sponsorship and holdouts, trying to get a sponsor. And, and all these deals are in the works that we don't know about. Um, you know, and I think that results a lot of the, the last minute conversation. Um, but, you know, from all, all teams are different when you work with them. Um, I've worked with sponsors uh, that, that are sponsors of a team um, and work with them directly. For example, this year, um, I, you know, with, with Go Fast Racing, I work specifically with Corey LaJoy himself and, um, and, and his group over there that uh, they'll contact me and say, hey, we're, um, Corey's got a, a pitch uh, for uh, a sponsor that it, it's, it's looking pretty good that he's going to get the sponsorship and we need to figure out what the car looks like. So, They've given me, you know, more than than a day to get these things done. Luckily, so, um, but usually when it's when it's a rush, uh, they usually get maybe one, maybe two. Um, when it's really down to the wire, it's just like you kind of get something just to put in front of them. And a lot of times, what we'll do is, um, you know, if if we had enough time ahead of time to talk with the team, uh, for example, with MBM, and I know that that Ryan's done this uh, with Starcom as well, have have a base work with so that they can easily swap out sponsors and colors and quickly get it out without spending too much time designing it. Um, it's cheaper for the team, it's more efficient for the designer, and it, you, you're able to adapt quickly, get it in front of a sponsor and say, Here, here here's what your car could look like. And it helps seal the deal with some of these, uh, some of these guys that they can visually see it and get excited about it. Um, it really just seals the deal for uh, the team or the, the driver who's approaching the sponsors. Definitely. And, and you got to think a lot of people, a lot of sponsors, when they're first seeing something like this, they might not have ever seen their logo on a race car. So it's really going to wow them uh, for the most part. And, and sometimes, you know, just using those, those base schemes that are kind of ready to go, uh, you know, you can do it the last minute uh, just to get somebody interested. Um, but, you know, every now and then you will get, uh, get a chance to design specifically for a sponsor. Uh, a design that you definitely wouldn't be able to use again. Um, I've had a few of those, and, and uh, there's been a few various points uh, in the past couple of years where, uh, you know, sending off a, a full, fully ready to go uh, paint scheme that's you know done just for one sponsor uh, was was basically what what made them say go. And uh, and kind of to, to go with what Sean was saying about some last minute uh, stuff. Actually, the the Permatex car that. I ran at Daytona uh, last year at the 500 uh, for Starcom with Landon Castle driving. Um, that actually all came together the weekend before the car had to leave to the racetrack. And over that weekend, um, I think like Friday afternoon is when I kind of got the heads up on it. And uh, over the course of the weekend, I had to put, uh, I think I put three total schemes together just to show them something Monday morning. Um, so because it, that way that they could pick something and, uh, we wouldn't have to make any changes, uh, and that way, like Tuesday or Wednesday, the car got wrapped. Um, so stuff like that's so it's really fun, um, but it's uh, it definitely uh, makes things interesting. That's for sure. Yeah, uh, just kind of going off of what Ryan just said there about um, how that deal kind of came together so late uh, last year uh, when David Reagan was still in the sport um, and the Select Blinds car. Uh, came together at Daytona. I actually had done five pitches for that car the, the week leading up to um, the 500, and uh, Select Blinds was just the the one that kind of stuck with. But uh, that was kind of one of those weeks where I was literally um, kind of on the edge of my seat at you know seven, eight, nine o'clock at night waiting for that email to come through, and they 
they did until that uh, select blinds um, paint scheme was approved and and uh, yeah so it's it, it is kind of crazy how uh, I, I don't think a lot of fans realize that even for, um, for well I guess a lot for those underfunded teams the teams that are searching for sponsorship that stuff comes together last second and last minute and and uh, you know they the teams kind of pull that off flawlessly. Yeah, the last minute, I, I tell you, that's the name of the game in the sport. Um, I remember uh, in 2018, um, I got a call from uh, Freight Auctions, Marcus Barella, who I work with a lot uh, in the series. And he calls me up and he's like, hey, Sean, good news, we're going racing. I'm like, that's awesome, when? Because uh, he, he usually sponsors Brett Moffitt uh, back when he was, you know, uh, with uh, HRE, uh, Hattori. So... <laughs> He was like, uh, for Chicago land. And it was literally like a few days away. And I'm like, that's, uh, that's like now. And he's like, yeah, it's going to be last minute. So I, I was like, all right, well, let me get on it. So, um, I called the rap company that was, that was doing the rap. And I said, all right, how much time do we have? We're, they're like, we're literally loading this truck in the morning. And I'm like, okay. So I'm like, so what, what can we do? And they said, we basically, you you can only do decals on a black truck we have a black truck in fact it's going to be wrapped when we get there we're putting the decals on one week once they get to the track so um it was such a last minute deal uh just all kind of came together for for marcus at the end you know they worked out a deal and uh, that was that was the, the race that he won at chicagoland so he ran freight auctions and we kind of rolled out um we're right in the middle of rolling out at that new freight brand where we redesigned the FR8 logo and we didn't quite have it ready. Like I, I almost put it on the truck, but I'm like, I, this is so rushed. I want to wait until I had time to really think about it. I wish I did. I wish I just threw it on the hood because it went to victory lane and it was an all black truck. So it was kind of a bummer from a designer standpoint, cause I could have done so much more to the paint scheme. Um, but you know, I did retool the, the, the brand that's on it and, uh, work some of the you know at least take credit for the the letters uh, being colored the way they are and uh kind of spun it you know I, it was i wanted to keep it all black so that all the confetti would stand off on it you know just kind of you know spin a story behind it but it was last minute and he ended up going to victory lane so it was kind of one of those yeah dude, it was, i was so pumped that he won but then i was so like kind of oh man i wish i had time to actually put together a good paint scheme for him so are you technically the only one that has ever had kind of a truck bin or a car i haven't yeah but. i mean the closest i came was uh alex bowman uh, you and i kyle both yeah. on the eda uh kind of oddly in the same route but uh, uh he came he placed second because he uh he had a few he, right. i think he really could have won that race but he came in second at the roval and uh that was as close in the cup that i got but yeah the truck was the only the only uh in fact the flag behind me is is the truck is the uh, one of the victory lane uh sunoco flags from victory lane so marcus uh marcus gave me one of those so it was grateful cool. um, to, to nice. do that now you didn't win a pole but did you design that trophy didn't you yeah the trophy the other the trophy is sitting over uh, on top of the flag is uh is a pole trophy that kevin harvick won at talladega um i think it was 2019 2018 maybe um yeah, it was freight auctions were sponsoring that. And, uh, you know, they come up with, with race trophies and they, they present them to the sponsors. And he was like, hey, it's okay. I really want to do something cool. So I worked with uh, a, a trophy company that produces pretty much all the trophies uh, in the sport and, uh, you know, kind of, you know, got some insight from them on what to do and what it can and can't do. And he's like, it's basically whatever you want. So I was like, I've never designed a trophy before. It was, it was a fun process. Um, I was able to design the logo that's on it. Um, that was painted really big on the infield. And, um, you know, I got to ride around the track and, and do all kinds of really cool stuff, you know, for uh, being a part of that. And I was in winter circle when Kevin pulled in and just kind of a surreal moment. You're standing there and Kevin Harvick's holding the trophy you designed. And awesome. it's just, it was just kind of weird for me. I was like, wow, this is, this is really happening right here. You know, it was a really cool experience. I, I don't know if I'll ever get another chance like that, uh, you know, to, to do something of that magnitude. That's a pretty unique thing to put on a resume for sure. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, he's done trophy race winning trucks. He's done cup series cars. I mean, that, that's a lot, but you know, this is kind of a good segue for 
the next topic, and that's going to be the concepts. In a, you know, Sean, in a given, you know, when you're given a sponsor pitch or you're given a request by a team, say if you have an ample amount of time to put together paint schemes, how many concepts do you guys go through? Because I remember this is a while back, and this, I don't know why, always stood out in my head. Harris, you retweeted a tweet one time where it was like something that a lot of people can relate to who are designers, like, you know, design final one, design file one A, you know, how many concepts do you go through in a typical pitch, Sean? You know, it always varies. Like, like I said before, on time, on the sponsor, some sponsors are pickier than others. You know, they have brand standards that they need to adhere to. And uh, you might not be aware of some of these brand standards and they might send you the guide after you design it and you have to go back and retool it. But um, if I have enough time, I generally like to give maybe four. That's a good amount. Um, it doesn't get too crazy. Um, some of the schemes will, will come from, you know, designing the, the one before it. You know, you might have, oh, that's cool. I want to try this and develop this more. And, you know, by, by the end of the design process, I'll have, a des I'll have artboards all over the place and I'll kind of skip around until I find one that I feel is, you know, is getting there. And then I'll kind of explore it and, you know, get that one finalized. And before you know, it's like three in the morning and I'm like, you know, I just need to get one finalized so that I can get to bed because I got to be up in a few hours you know, so, and then I got to do this thing all over again. So um, it really depends, you know, a lot of times, like Kyle said, if you're up late and you're cranking them out, you get what you get, you know, so that it allows you for at least two hours of sleep. So you can, you can get up and go the next day. So each of you have a very unique design style. So I just want to briefly hit each, each of you guys and tell me just about, you know, what is your style? So we'll start with Ryan, we'll go to Sean Harris, and then we'll jump to Kyle. Um, for me, you know, I really think one of the biggest things that I, I like to uh, to focus on are just like bold colors and shapes. Uh, I think that those are important in design regardless. I think they're really important in motorsports design because, um, you know, they draw your eye to whatever you're looking at, you know, and, and race cars are so fast uh, and they need to be seen not only by people at the racetrack, uh, but, you know, by people, you know, on TV. Um, you know, so I always try to design with that in mind, um, you know, make sure that the ma design makes sense, um, make sure that the sponsors can be read well. Um, I always try to, you know, stand back, uh, and look like, you know, at my design, what I'm, whatever I'm working on, I like to look at it from far away to make sure it all, like I said, it all makes sense and all gels well together and just make sure that it, it doesn't look like a glob, um, you know, from far away. Um, but, you know, I really think that 70s and 80s motorsport really, really did this well, uh, this whole style of just using bold shapes and colors. And, and I'd like to pull from that a lot, a lot of inspiration from that era. And not just NASCAR, but uh, Formula One, all kinds of open wheel racing, uh, sports cars. There's a really good, there's really good styles in all of those. And uh, I like to pull from all those a little bit. And, of course, add my own little twist here and there. Um, but, uh, but, yeah, I just love having fun with it and hopefully hopefully one day we'll have one that can be considered a classic yeah i think that every every designer um has the thought of you know 20 years from now or is somebody going to be throwbacking a paint scheme i did you know i think that that would be the coolest thing you know is, is we're all old and sitting in our recliners you know watching nascar as old men you know and somebody some young designer comes on the scene and totally butchers one of our designs and it calls it a throwback you know it'd be kind of a cool experience but uh, as far as design style, um, you know, uh, my, my design style, I, I've noticed as, as you know, I, I sat back and kind of, you know, looked at some of the ones that I've created recently and, and throughout the years. I don't do a lot of uh, free flowing, flowy type designs. They generally are, are sharp lines, you know, so there's a lot of angles and a lot of, uh, you know, straight lines and points to it. Um, as example of, you know, some of the freight cars are going to be running this weekend in Atlanta are very sharp. There's hardly any, you know, curves to it. And so I tend to gravitate towards that. Obviously, I like, you know, metallics. Um, even if, you know, Harris won't allow me to run it on track, I can simulate, you know, what it's going to look like in metal. Um, so, you know, I've, I have a few of those. The trophy behind me has got a little metal look on it. Uh, so that's definitely, you know, something that I like to, to put in there, a little bit of texture, but not go overboard. Um, you know, the, the more I think the more that we as designers get into design and, and kind of take a look at what's going on with 
trends and whatnot. And um, you look at the Hendrick cars and they're trending, they're trending way towards the clean, you know, very, you know, solid base. Um, and I think a lot of design is kind of going that direction as well. So I think you're going to see a lot of cars kind of tame it down a little bit and just use more block solid colors uh, with, with subtle accents on them. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I'd have to say I'm probably more similar to to Ryan. Um, definitely a fan of of the bold colors, the you know, big powerful logos. I you know, as designers, sometimes we have to be chameleons every now and then. And like when you're designing for a brand, you got to put yourself in that brand and look at what they do and look at how they do things and kind of blend your style with with theirs. Um, and like we talked in the last podcast, I like to take new techniques and and employ old tactics with the new techniques so you know with the vinyl and stuff like that trying to make it you know think in my head okay how would they have had to do this would they have had to tape this off how would they have had to paint this back in the day um and that carries into other work other than paint schemes like when i make t-shirts or when i make hat designs i look at you know okay we got this really expensive dtg printer that's just going to print the t-shirt like a like a, a printer but I'm going to use this technique that they used to use back in the nineties or eighties. Um, so definitely heavily inspired by the past and, and, you know, kind of simple and clean. That's, that's where I, I like to direct. It might not always land there, but that's, that's where I start. And that's my goal. Uh, and I think for me, like, um, you know, I, I really like to go towards the, the eye catching, you know, lots of detail, color gradients, you know, kind of opposite of, of, you know, the, kind of the way that the sport's going right now. I think, um, you know, for me, when I've gone to races with, with friends that, um, you know, have never been to a race before, they find the most vibrant, cool looking car out there. And um, I think that that's kind of what I have in mind is that if I design a car that is so eye catching and it grabs your attention, that's the car that maybe a first time uh, race fan is gonna you know root for and, and maybe that's what's gonna get them into the sport a little bit more but um, I think right when I kind of just started doing this that was my approach is I wanted to um, you know go more for that um, really detailed uh, you know eye-catching design um, because like you uh, like Sean had kind of mentioned is that you know Hendrick and and other teams are kind of going more towards that clean and simple and, and there's nothing wrong with that because some of those are the most uh the greatest looking cars i mean you look at even uh you know back in the day like dale jr's number eight car uh just plain red i mean there's just something so that was just so great looking about that but um i think for me um you know finding a way to uh grab the attention of, of first time race fans or new race fans that um that's kind of what I focus on is, is more of the, you know, really sometimes over the top paint schemes, but uh, I try to make it all kind of cohesive and, and, and work in a way that uh, will look good on the track. So you bring up Dale Jr. And that's actually a yeah. great, a great component to what our next topic is. So last week we debated on which uh, scheme was more, uh, I guess, define the generation between Dale Earnhardt's Black Number 3 and Jeff Gordon's Rainbow 24. This time, now this is kind of an interesting topic that I've uh, always wanted to discuss with somebody, and we're going to do it right here, is which Dale Jr. era do you associate that had the best paint schemes? The 88 era or the 8 era? Not so much the most iconic, but like the best designs. And I know Sean and Kyle might have a bit of a skewed opinion because they were part of the 88 era. But let's just kind of talk a little bit about, you know, which schemes did you guys think were Dale Jr.'s best in the 88 or during the 8 era? Ryan, we'll start with you. Um, <clears throat> I, uh, I think both eras are, are great. Um, you know, I mean, Dale's cars, he's, he's like one of the paint scheme aficionados. He's always going to have uh, a good looking car and he, he, knows, what, he knows what he likes and uh, he, he seems to have a pretty good taste. Uh, but I, I really like, uh, I really like the eight, the eight, uh, era a little bit more. Um, I really, uh, you know, the paint schemes kind of tend to go more with, with what I, you know, like, like style wise, uh, a lot more bold, um, big logos, uh, you know, really recognizable. Um, 
you know, I, obviously the classic, the, the one with the black roof that started it all in this in the little stripes, but even with the simpler version with these stripes, it was, uh, it was pretty cool to, to bring it across styles and I thought it worked really well. And, uh, the born on date cars were always done so well with the metallics, uh, with the, uh, the painted bodies and, uh, they were always, always really beautiful. Um, but you know, they've had some beautiful 88 cars too, but, uh, every time I take a Dale Jr., the, the eight Budweiser cards immediately pops in my head uh, with that paint scheme. Sean, how about you? Yep, the 2004 uh, Dale Jr. Uh, Budweiser Born on Car. I mean that that's what that's what you think of Bud Eight Dale Jr. I mean that's that's at least that's what I think of as far as paint schemes. The best I think that you know some of his 88 paint schemes like the Mountain Dew and the National Guard. Um, you know those cars are you know also iconic to a generation as well, but you know, I think when I think Dale Jr., you know, I, I go back to that first Daytona win in 2004, you know, with the, um, you know, with everything that was going on with him at the time. That's what I remember of, of Dale Jr. Harris? And I got to go Budweiser too. the eight. You know, it, it, Sam Bass was the originator of all the DEI schemes. I mean, he did Steve Parks, he did Dale's, he did uh, Michael Waltrips. And, and those from the, the thin lines to the E stripe, he did all that. Um, and it, it, he was the designer for, for most of the DEI stuff. So I've got a little personal tie, so I might be a little biased, but, uh, I will say that, that the car of tomorrow did no favors for, uh, Dale Jr.'s paint schemes in the 88. <laughs> but once we got to gen six, um, and up, I, I think he had amazing looking cars and, and some of the best in the field, but, uh, got to always go with that iconic number eight. I, uh, I think this is a clean sweep. I think I agree also with the eight. Um, I think, I mean, that's the car uh, that I, that was the first uh, race I ever went to was uh, in, in Indianapolis in 2007. And that car, that red number eight uh, caught my eye. And um, I mean, that's how I became a Dale Jr. fan right from there. But, um, you know, just like Harris said, it was perfect. I think, you know, when, when they start, started uh, racing or when he started racing the 88. Uh, the car tomorrow um, did, definitely didn't didn't uh, really translate well with those paint schemes. But when he started, uh, you know, racing the Chevy SS, and I mean, those were some really good looking race cars. But um, you know, for me, I always think about. Um, actually, I just kind of did a concept on my Instagram a couple of weeks ago about there was the the Budweiser Patriotic one, there was the Budweiser Camel one. I mean, there was just so many iconic. Uh, number eight cars but uh, yeah I mean you think about that red number eight and I think even for his farewell um, tour they had they ran that um, Budweiser commercial um, and it was with eight car and because I think that's what uh, that's what he was uh, known for and that's what he kind of just represented uh, he was represented in that way where he was so recognizable uh, in those DEI days. See, I understand uh, where you're all coming. No, 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 listen. <laughs> I understand where you're all coming from. The Budweiser number eight is one of the most iconic cars probably in NASCAR modern history. I mean, it's so popular. Even if you're not a NASCAR fan, you've seen it. But it just, it pains me that he had the performance in the 88. But I do prefer the number eight era designs. Now, my favorite one was probably the number eight, the patriotic one that he ran in 2007. I can't even tell you how many yeah. times I tried to recreate that car, like in NASCAR, the game, you know, with that great paint booth. I mean, that was always one of my favorite cars. And then even when he ran, you know, I always liked the 06, 07 era of NASCAR for some, re for some reason. When he used to run at the super speedways, his car was fully red. He had the red tape. He had the red spoiler. He had the red splitter. I mean, I'm sorry, the valence, Harris, because I know Harris will get on me for that later on. <laughs> Everything was red. The like the car, the car just looked so uniform. It was gorgeous. And that's actually one die cast that I kind of wish I did have was just something from that 06, 07 era. But also on the contrary, I, for one, actually enjoyed the COT era. I didn't think the cars were like drop dead gorgeous, but I also didn't really mind it. So if any of you guys want to throw me a rebuttal, I'll give you 20 seconds each because we're running out of time. 
the twenty. Go ahead. Oh, Ryan. All right. All right. All right. Oh, 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 I was gonna say the uh, the the first COT was pretty terrible, uh, but by the time they got, I think twenty twelve was the last year of it. I I kind of was digging the way that they were uh, working on it, but I really I was really happy to see Gen Six come out. They might as well turn the car out of toothpicks at that point. I mean, you didn't even get anywhere near a blade of grass, and you're done. I mean, okay. it's just destroyed. I mean, it, by, by 2011, 2012, it looked more like the modern Xfinity car now than it did this, the 2007, 2008 COT. But, man, that first one with the splitter rods and the big Fast and the Furious wing, it was just – I mean, and how, how many die casts do people have now with no wing left on them? It <laughs> broke. A lot of them broke. And then the one thing I was going to say was not even looks-wise, but I just loved the way that those cars sounded. That was probably the biggest thing for me. I mean, you, those things just screamed down the straightaway. I remember going to races, and you could literally close your eyes and physically hear the difference between a Chevy and a Ford and a Toyota. And that was one of the things that I realized uh, about the COTs. I mean, you came to love them. I mean, we all love racing, and we were going to love no matter what you know we put out there, whether um, you know the the look was appealing or not. But I think. Uh, that was the biggest thing for me is, I mean, I think we're going to miss that sound, you know, coming with the next gen car. It's going to be, it's going to be different. So with that being said, we're going to wrap up episode number two. So there was a major topic we did not get to this episode because of time constraints, but the next episode, we're actually going to dive into a lot of the concept schemes that Sean, Ryan Harris and Kyle have designed, but never saw the light of day. And we'll also touch on some, uh, concepts even in that these guys didn't make like you know maybe some sand bass concepts or things of that nature so thanks for watching we'll see you guys on the next episode